Now, um, obviously we're starting in Genesis chapter 6 is a real famous story, and it continues on through chapter 7, 8, 9, um, is the story of the flood. Noah's Ark, right? This is where Noah builds the ark, and God sends a flood upon all the world. So I'm going to kind of preach through this story a little bit and just kind of highlight a few key points that I want to focus on. But um, first we start off with why did God... Even, see, like, most people hear about Noah's Ark. You think about animals, you think about a boat, and, you know, all the animals come two by two, they line up in the boat, they're on the water for a while, and then, and then that's it. And, like, it's kind of turned into a real big... I know there's a lot of stuff for our kids. You know, we have a lot of kids' toys, and I'm not against that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But it's kind, of, it's kind of gotten to the point where that's the focus. The focus is on the animals for the, for the flood that was sent on the earth. And, you know, really, I want to point out here real quick, why did God even send a, a, a flood on the earth to begin with? It wasn't to give us this great story about animals going two by two onto a big boat, right? Look at verse number five of Genesis six. It says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. God basically became sorry that he even created man. Man had gotten so wicked, man had just gotten, just, just, it wanted to have nothing to do with God, and just getting into wickedness and getting into sin, that God was sorry that he even ever created man to begin with. That's what it says in verse 6. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So the whole point of the flood is God's destroying the earth. God's destroying all of mankind and, and, and all the animals. He's like, he says both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, I'm just going to wipe it all out. I'm just going to, I'm just going to destroy all of it. Because of the wickedness, because they didn't want anything to do with God, because they decided to follow their own heart, follow the desires of their own heart, and not listen to what God had for them. They wanted to do things on their own. The Bible says in verse 11, it says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So the, the point of the flood is, is massive destruction. It's the wrath of God. God's getting angry. And this is something that's forgotten as well these days. You know, everybody talks about the greatness and the goodness and the love of God, which, again, over and over again, I will not deny that ever. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is love. God is a loving God. But God has wrath. And we cannot forget the point that God has wrath. I mean, he has, every once in a while, he has to just do it. He has to just rain down fire and brimstone. He has to send a flood upon the earth or whatever when, when man just decides to be stiff-necked, not to listen to what God has for them, and just, just do their own thing, become wicked, become just too involved in their sin. And like in this point, the earth just had gotten so corrupt, God just said, you know what, I'm just going to destroy everything in it. And he sends a flood, and that's exactly what he did. See, God destroyed the whole world, but it didn't have to be that way. I mean, it's, it's not like it had to be that way. God knows how to deliver his people out of trouble. God's the one who sent the flood. If people would have just been a little bit more obedient and would have just been a little bit more reverent to God, none of this would have had to happen, but, but they let themselves go. But here's the thing. The, the good thing is that even if the world around you is going to hell, even if everybody else around you is living a wicked lifestyle, God knows how to deliver his people out of that trouble. This is exactly what he did with Noah. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So Noah was a man who, wanted, who, who believed in God. Noah was a man who was, who was basically following God's commandments, doing what was right. He was a righteous man. Now, was he perfectly and, sin, perfect and sinless? No. No man is. But there's a big difference between someone who's, you know, living a righteous life. Yes, they have some sins in their life. There's a huge difference between that and people who are just going out and just, and just living, you know, a life of just total wickedness and total sin. Okay, there's a big difference. And God points this out over and over again throughout the Bible because we know that no man is perfect. Jesus Christ was the only one that was perfectly sinless. But we see here Noah, he calls him just and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. 
Noah had a relationship with God. He walked with God. Noah loved God. And, um, of course, God delivers Noah. And notice here how, how God is with Noah. And look at, um, we're going to flip over chapter number 7. Look at verse number 1. It says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. What's interesting about this is, is the Lord speaks unto Noah, but he says, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Which means that word come, he didn't say go into the ark. He said, come into the ark, which would imply that God's in the ark, right? God's there, and he's saying, hey, come into the ark. Which means it's, you know, it's God's will. God will be with Noah in the ark. Noah has nothing to fear. Even though there's going to be this great flood, even though God's going to, you know, pour out his rain for 40 days and 40 nights upon the earth, and the fountains of the deep are going to be broken up, even though there's going to be this massive flood that's going to kill everybody, God said, hey, come with, me. come into the ark. This is where I am. Come with me. Come into the ark. For thee have I seen as righteous before me in this generation. And Noah loaded up the ark with his family and all the animals. And then look at verse number 16 of chapter 7. It says, and they, and they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. God is really taking care of Noah here. He's making sure he said, look, Come into the ark, and then he, when he gets in, he gets everybody loaded up. God shuts them in. God seals that door. God closes the closes them in to, to you know basically again he seals them and he protects them and he keeps them safe for all the wrath that's wrath that's going to come. Now, just an interesting side. I'm not going to spend very much time on this and all, but in, in chapter six it tells us the size of the ark, and just to give you an idea in, in today's terms because. It uses cubits. It says here, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. Of uh, The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. You say, well, what's a cubit? You know, we don't use cubits anymore. A cubit was the, the distance from, the, from your elbow to the top of your hand. So it's not an exact measurement, but... It averages about a foot and a half. In today's, in today's measurements, about a foot and a half. So if you figure a cubit's approximately one and a half feet, the arc was about 450 feet or 150 yards long. That's pretty long. It's longer than, than a football field, right? Just, just to give you the, the, an image of what the arc actually looked like, how big it was and the expanse of it. The arc was about 150 yards long. It was 75 feet wide or about 25 yards and then it was four stories tall. It was about 45 feet tall. So it's like a four-story building that's the length of, bigger than the length of a football field. And then 25 yards wide. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty big boat. You can see how you could get you know, all of these animals and people and be able to store food and everything for the amount of time that they were on the ark. And, um, and that's what he said here. It says in verse 16, it says, A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set aside thereof with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. So he had three stories, but the, but the height of it total was about four stories, right? About a four-story building. But he had three levels inside of that ark with rooms and, and everything else. So it was a pretty big deal. I'm, and you know, it took him quite a while to, to complete this. I think it was about a year. Now, um, many people, when they hear this, They'll, they'll scoff at the biblical account of the flood for, for many reasons. People will scoff, especially in Genesis, about a lot, a lot of different things in the Bible. They'll make fun of it. They'll say, oh, you actually believe the Bible? You believe what that says? Well, my question to you is, what do you believe? Do you believe God's word or do you put more faith in man's lack of understanding of ancient history and, and the things that happened during this time? See, first of all, what people will do, look at chapter 7, verse number 6. The Bible says that Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. The first thing they'll make fun of is just say, 600 years old, yeah, right. You know, because we're so advanced these days. We've got technology, we've got all the, you know, medical science, like way better than they ever could have had back then. There's no way people were living to be 600 years old back then, and we're only living to maybe 100 years now. And people will scoff at that and make fun of it. But the Bible tells us very simply that people did live to be that old. 
And it wasn't until after the flood that people started, where, where God just said, hey, I'm going to limit man's numbers on earth to be about 120 years old. He said, that's it. And, um, and after the flood, you see that progression of people who were, um, who were being born there. You know, prior to that, people were living eight, 900 years old, seven, you know, like hundreds of years. Think about the amount of knowledge you could accumulate in almost a millennium of just being alive on this earth. I mean, the older you get, the more that you learn. I mean, you're constantly learning. You're constantly learning new things. I mean, whatever work you do, whatever trade you do, whatever things you do, I mean, even just like around the house, I know when I have projects to work on, the more, the older I get, the more experience you build and the smarter you are, the more wisdom you have. Imagine the amount of wisdom people had that were living for hundreds of years to be able to just really refine process and really just do things more efficiently and a lot better and um, be able to pass that knowledge down onto, uh, onto the next generations and they have that starting point and they're still living for hundreds of years. So to say that, you know, it, the problem is that they believe, most, a lot of people believe in this theory of evolution that we came from monkeys and that we're these cavemen and just, there's these stupid brutes that, that had to invent fire, had to invent something like a wheel, like, oh, oh, you know, oh, fire, oh, and, you know, and, and had to survive that way, as opposed to a God-created man, someone who God breathed in their nostrils, and God spoke to them, and was able to teach them wisdom, and able to teach them knowledge, so that from the very beginning, yeah, man had language, they were able to speak, Adam was able to, to name all of the animals that God had created. He wasn't just some, some dumb caveman dwelling somewhere in, in a cave with, you know, trying to figure out how to retain fire. <clears throat> but here's the, I mean, people will make fun of this, though. They'll make fun of you if you believe that. But you have to decide for yourself, what do you believe? And even basic physics will teach us today that the world is getting more and more disorganized. Things are not becoming more complicated. Things do not become more structured. If you understand this basic, you know, thermodynamics and physics, that the world is, is continually, you know, getting more and more disorganized and destructured. Yet their theories of evolution will teach you that things are getting more and more complicated and things are getting, you know, better and, and more evolved and more advanced. And it's just simply not the case. And, um, <coughs> but the other thing, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this because it's a lot more pertinent to the actual flood. Verse 4 of chapter 7 says... For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. A lot of even Christians out there today will tell you that the flood did not cover the entire earth. They'll say it was just a localized flood, it didn't cover the entire earth, it was just in one area, and it was just for the known world at that time. For the, for the civilization that were around at that time. And I'm going to demolish this argument because it's ridiculous to say that it did not cover everywhere. Now, what they like to focus on, they'll say, oh, you think that just because it says, you know, they'll destroy them from off the face of the earth, that you're, you mean it's the entire planet. And it's like, well, no. See, what they do is they build a straw man. They'll say, the Bible doesn't, all, when it says the earth, it does, it's not always talking about the entire globe. And that's correct. It's not always talking about the entire globe. When the Bible says the earth, I mean, it could be referring to a, a location. It could be referring to the people in the earth. It could be referring to a lot of different things. But the reason, it's, that's, not the, that's not the only reason the verbiage that you see in the Bible, you'll see over and over again. See, you have to understand when, a, when words could be used in multiple ways to mean different things, like the earth meaning just the earth in this location, the earth meaning the, the whole planet, the earth meaning just the physical soil and the ground, whatever it is. The only way you can interpret that is through the context, right? If it has multiple meanings, you have to see, well, what is everything else around it saying to be able to get that understanding of what is it talking about in context? Well, in this first verse, in verse 4, it says, if, he says, I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. So is there any, does it seem like there's any doubt that he's, that he's going to kill every living substance that he made? So wherever that might be, whether it's all localized or whether it's across the entire planet, wherever it is, every living substance that God made, he says here he's going to destroy. Now, <coughs> the problem is, is that people will, will look to science 
and and they'll think that like science is and, and see I don't like using the word science because there's there's good science is true, right? Real science. There's nothing wrong with science. I love science, and science is great when it's when it's used properly and when it's understood properly and, and people like to, to go off and, and they'll have bad science, they'll make bad assumptions or they'll just, I mean, they'll use it improperly to where it's not giving a proper result and just try to say, well, look, we use science to get this so science is true and people kind of elevate science, you know, into a, into a religion to where, well, science has the, has the top and then what the Bible says is next. If your science is contradicting what the Bible says, your science is wrong. <clears throat> and what Christians will do is that a lot of times they're ignorant. They just don't understand the science, but someone's telling them, oh no, this can't be, this is impossible, because science says it's impossible, and they'll, they'll use some big words that, that they don't understand, and they don't know much about the subject, so they'll say, oh, well, this guy's an expert, and if he's saying that it's impossible, then you know, I have to maybe change, and I'll, you know, they end up compromising what the Bible says, and then try to change, well, it couldn't really be this because, you know, we know God's word is true, but, you know, these guys are saying it's impossible. Don't get scared by, by some PhD somewhere that's saying that, that evolution's a fact or something like that because it's ridiculous. It's not. Don't ever compromise the scripture because you're just going to make yourself look foolish and stupid when you try to compromise and just change and say, well, I know the Bible says that, but that's not what it means. No, if it's, that's what it says, it's what it means. Look at uh, verse number 11, Genesis chapter 7. It says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So this is interesting because, you know, you think of the flood. In verse 12, it says, and the, rain, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. You think of, oh yeah, God sent rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, that wasn't the only source of the flood because the Bible also says that the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Right, so prior to this time, Bible says in um, <clears throat> in Genesis one, like in the Garden of Eden, there was a mist that came up from the ground. So there was waters, literally like like in underground. There's underground waters, right? And um, here, not only did it rain for forty days and forty nights, but we also had the great fountains of the deep broken up. So. If you're wondering how just rainfall can make it flood the entire earth, well, that wasn't just alone. There was rain coming from above, from the clouds, and then there was water getting, getting pushed up when the great fountains of the deep were broken up. And all this happened on the same day that everyone entered into the ark. And that's what it says in verse 13. In the self-same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of the, his sons with them <coughs> into the ark. So the very same day they get in the ark, boom, all this stuff happens. God sends the rain and, and, the, and the great floods of the deep, uh, the waters of the deep are, are broken up. The fountains of the great deep are broken up. And it says in verse 17, And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. Again, these people who deny that it was a worldwide flood will say that, oh yeah, above the earth just means above the ground where it was. Okay, I won't even dispute that. The ark was lifted up above the earth. Sure, in context, that's, that's probably what it's saying, is that it was on the ground, and then as the waters come, the, the boat lifts up, and it lifts up above the ground. Of course that's what it means. I'm not, see, they build this straw man to try to make you think, that, like, oh, this is the argument for a worldwide flood, is because it says earth here, and that, and that we're just assuming it's the entire planet every single time it's used. But that's not the case, because in the next few verses, we're going to see there's a lot more than just that. Look at verse 18, it says, And the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. Verse 19, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. So now we're talking about everything under the whole heaven. That leaves a lot less doubt, in my mind, when it says, first of all, when it's talking about the whole earth, I could see where you could interpret that a slightly different way and say, well, it's only talking about the earth here, you know, in one, in one location. But when he says... All the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. And then he says in verse 20, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. So let me tell you this. All the highest hills and then all the mountains are covered with water. How can that water be localized in one place? If it's going over the mountains, the water's going to run over the mountains into the next area, right? 
So I mean, if it's going over mountains, how can that possibly be localized? Just and, and if it's going 15 cubits above the mountains, there's no way. I mean, the water has to go somewhere. Water covered, <coughs> excuse me, the entire earth. And it says in verse 21, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, and of cattle, and of beasts, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. So now where in all of this account of the flood could one ever conceive that the flood was just localized in one region? I mean, if God's destroying everything, it wasn't even just man. If you say, well, man was just in this one region, okay, well, what about all the animals? Because the Bible says that he destroyed all the animals that lived in, and have the breath of life upon the entire earth. I don't think all of the animals decided just to congregate in one area. I mean, maybe humans did. Maybe people did. They lived in communities and stuff. But I highly doubt that all the birds, all the creeping things, all the bugs, all the animals just decided to stay. Hey, here's all the humans. Let's just stay with all the humans. In fact, that's a little bit contrary to the way things are in life today and the way life has always been. A lot of animals don't like being around humans because... They, a human could be a predator for them. They're going to be scared of them. They're not going to want to live right up where the humans are. They're going to be a little bit away from them, at least a little bit away from them. And there's no reason for them to stick around by humans when you've got an entire world full of, of trees and fruit and, and other things that can provide sustenance. And one other thing, and I just thought about this right now, how in the world can you have vegetation in the other parts of the world without having insects and bees and birds and everything else to cross-pollinate and to do the things that are required for vegetation to grow, at least for, for, for many of these things to, to happen, even just to reproduce, like we know of today. It's impossible for that type of vegetation to reproduce without having insects and without having these other, you know, these other part of the, um, the environment, the entire environment, to, to, to work together to continue growing everything. So in order to destroy all of those things, they have to be destroyed everywhere. It's not just localized. But see, modern science is always trying to disprove the great miracles of the Bible. When God does something massive, when God does something huge, and, and something like you know flooding the entire earth, science is going to come and just try to debunk it or try to just you say, oh, well, it's, that's, that's not really that. It wasn't that big of a miracle. It really, and you'll read this. I was reading some of this stuff yesterday. Oh, yeah, the, the, you know, the rivers flood the area. And it could have just been a really big flood. And, you know, people, you know, it was just a big disaster. But, you know, there's no way it could have just killed everybody and everything. You know, and they, just, they just try to downplay God's miracles. And if you add the years from Adam to the flood, it's 1,656 years. That's a long time. 1,656 years just from, from using the, um, the, the account that the Bible gives of like when people were born and stuff. You could go back. You could count backwards. From the time of the flood to Adam, 1,656 years. That's a long time for people to reproduce and fill the earth. That's also a long time for the animals to be dispersed. I mean, over the course of 1,656 years, don't you think that animals are going to be multiplying and growing and kind of spreading out more than just one little localized region to say that that was the only area that was covered with water by earth? And how about the birds? I mean, they could fly around. Here's the thing. In order for God to destroy everything, destroy all of the birds, all the insects, everything, I mean, if it was just localized, the birds, insects, or whatever, they can go over not very far away then at the edges of where this this flood was localized to and survive just on the other side of whatever area that, that these people are talking about. And then they wouldn't have been destroyed. But the Bible is very clear that he destroyed everything. Upon reading everything found in Scripture, if you don't believe that the flood is worldwide, then I, then I would say that you just simply don't believe the Bible. It's that simple. I mean, the Bible is very clear about it. There's many places where the Bible talks about the flood. We're going to continue on here. Look at verse number 8. I mean, sorry, chapter number 8. We're going to skip to chapter number 8. We're going to continue on with the, the story of the flood. 
in uh, verse number two, it says, The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. So the ark, once the waters are coming down, finally rests in the mountains again. I mean, people will try, and I was reading these dumb arguments. They're trying to say, oh, well, and, and that's what the other thing they'll try to do is they'll try to correct the Bible with their concordance. And they'll say, oh, the Greek, the, the Hebrew word here, you know, sometimes it's, it's used as mountains, but sometimes it's used as hills. So they'll say, obviously it was a mountain because of my understanding of the Bible, then it must have just been a hill. And they'll just, they'll just go back and correct the Bible because when it clearly says it covers all the mountains and it goes over the mountains, you can't argue with that. So they'll just say, oh, well, that, just, that translation is just wrong. Because they just can't accept it. They don't want to believe that. But here, even here, it's just saying, look, it, was, it rested upon the mountains of Ararat. That's where the, the ark rested. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the, in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. Now, after the flood's over, right, everyone exits on, on dry land. Verse 21 of chapter 8 says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Now, there's two things that he says here. And if you remember in, the, in, the, in, the, in Genesis, well, we'll look at it real quick. Look at the first part of 21. It says, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. He's talking about cursing the ground. In Genesis chapter number 3, when after Adam and Eve sinned, right, they, they ate of the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, God curses them. To the woman, he says, you know, with sorrow, you're going to bring forth children, and thy desire shall be unto thy husband. And then he says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return." So God cursed the ground because of that sin. But it says here, he lifts that curse. In Genesis 8, 22, it says, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And then he says, neither, so what he's also not going to do, another thing, he says, neither will I again smite anymore every living thing as I have done. Okay? He's never going to, God is never going to send a flood upon this earth to destroy everything again. It says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So again, you have these people that are talking about, you know, global warming and all this environmental stuff and saying we're going to destroy the earth. You know, every, mankind is going to die. We're all going to be killed. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen until Jesus Christ comes back. So what can we learn from the flood? From the flood, we can learn that God has a wrathful side. God destroyed, I mean, God made a, a major event happen here where he destroyed everything. I mean, killing everything that was alive. He said, no more chances. I'm done. I'm wiping the whole slate clean. Everything's getting wiped out. But it's also a foreshadowing of wrath and judgment to come because it's going to come again. It's not going to be a flood. But when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to come back to judge. And there is going to be, the wrath of God is going to be seen on this earth. Just as God destroyed the world at a time when wickedness abounded, the same is going to be the case when he comes to judge the world again. And I'll tell you what, my friends, we're headed that way. Because wickedness in this world, worldwide, is abounding. Luke 17, verse 26 says, And as it was in the days of Noah, talking about Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. This is referring to, you know, this is using the example of the flood and of Noah to explain what's going to come in the future. It says in verse 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So what he's saying is, look, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. You know, everything was fine and dandy on the earth. 
right? Everyone's just living life and everything's just going great all the way up until the day that Noah gets into the ark. He says it's going to be the same way. When Jesus Christ comes back, hey, people are going to be marrying, they're going to be eating, drinking, having fun, you know, living it up until the day that Christ comes back and brings judgment down. It says, likewise also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When Jesus Christ comes back, and in both of these examples, the example with Lot and the example with Noah, God was protecting his, his people, okay? He took them out from the wrath that was, good, that was to come. He saved Noah from God's wrath of sending the flood to destroy the whole world. And God saved Lot out of the wrath of the fire and brimstone being poured down on Sodom and Gomorrah and destroying those cities. The same way it's going to be when Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds, every saved person on this earth is going, to be, is going to be taken up. We're going to be raptured. That's the event of the rapture because that's going to be the event that signals God pouring out his wrath on this earth and sending forth all of the plagues that are in the book of Revelation on this earth that we won't be going through God's wrath. Now, prior to that time, we'll be going through tribulation because the world's going to be extremely wicked. And Christians are going to be targeted. And we're going to go through hard times and tribulation. We're going to go through a great tribulation such as never was from the beginning of, of time, essentially. And But we will not be experiencing God's wrath, God's punishment on this earth. See, God's going to destroy the world again, but not with water. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3. It's going to be the last place that we turn. 2 Peter chapter 3. <coughs> Second Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1, the Bible says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by, the, by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, <coughs> walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep... All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This is talking about the flood. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So he's saying, the worlds that then were, hey, they were overflowed with water. They perished. But the heaven and earth, which are now, were, they're reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. The day of judgment is coming. Okay? And it says in the last time there's going to be scoffers. We've got scoffers today. People that mock the Bible. People say, oh, yeah, where is God? You know, this is so old. You know, the New Testament was written some 2,000 years ago warning us about judgment that's going to come. It's been 2,000 years. Really? If God was coming, you'd think he wouldn't have come by now. And they'll just make fun of it and say, you know, they mock at it. They'll laugh at it. But judgment is coming. And I'll tell you what. When things are going great, and that's what people are eating, drinking, marrying, and getting wives. Hey, everything's going great in life. Pfft. Yeah, it's easy to laugh at God. It's easy to say, where is God? When you're not really going through very much hard time, when you don't have the troubles going on, it's really easy to say that. And I'll tell you what, and I'll tell you right now, be warned because the more comfortable you get, it's easier to just disregard God's word. And just disregard the rules that he set forth for us. And just disregard it and say, yeah, yeah, well, God's not going to care. It's not a big deal. If it's in God's word, if it's printed in this book, it's a big deal. If God says a commandment, if he tells us to do something or not to do something, it's there for a reason. Don't just overlook it and don't just think God's just going to look the other way. Because he's not. Okay, God is angry with the wicked every day. And God will have punishment for sins. God has judgment. Now, praise the Lord that we are saved eternally and we'll go to heaven no matter what sins we do. 
Thank God for his mercy on that. But I'll tell you what, if you're a son of God today, God is going to chastise you. God will discipline you the more that you just decide to not obey what he has for you and not, and not do what he says. Now, I don't know. In the days of Noah, there might have been other men that were saved, but they were living a wicked life. They weren't doing what was right. Okay? They might have believed on the Lord. There were a lot of people around in that time. I don't necessarily believe that absolutely nobody was saved in the times of Noah. The Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Okay, if Noah was a preacher, he probably, he probably convinced somebody to believe on the Lord. But that didn't stop them from receiving the punishment and, and dying in the flood. Okay, now if they were saved, of course they went to heaven. But they drowned. And here's the thing, in this lifetime, we want to make sure that we're obeying God and, and doing everything that he has and put him first and just say, God, I'm just going to do whatever it is that you want me to do. And, and I'm not going to just disregard what you have for me and, and disregard your word. I'm going to listen to what you say, because I know that if I don't listen, you're going to deal with me as a, as a loving father would to a son, as a loving parent would. When my daughters, if they, if they look at me, if they say, I know that you told me not to do this, but I'm just going to go and do it anyways. Guess what? They're going to be punished. They're going to be disciplined because I love them, because I don't want them to have that attitude towards their father. And I'm going to say, you know what? You're going to get this punishment, and, and I still love you. You're still, my, you're still my child. Nothing could ever change that fact, but you're going to get punished. We as God's children will go through the same exact thing. But if we, if we embrace God's laws, if we embrace God's word and say, you know what, God? I love you. I'm gonna, I, I appreciate the fact that you saved my soul. I'm going to try to do whatever it is that you want me to do. Hey, we also can be blessed by that. And, um, and, and God will treat us greatly and nicely and will bless us. And um, we'll have a lot more happiness in general in our lives if we, if we would just realize that and just, and just submit ourselves unto God. Continuing on here in 2 Peter chapter 3. Because it's talking about the judgment to come. It's reserved unto fire. Judgment is coming again. And this is what people need to be warned about. This is what the unsaved people need to be warned about. Is that Jesus Christ is coming again. Now the first time he came to this earth. He came in love. He came to save the world. He came to give himself up. He came as a servant. He came as somebody that humbled himself. And took the form of a man. He was an infant. He was a child. He was <laughs> raised by parents. You know, he allowed himself to be mocked and ridiculed and spit on and beat up. And he allowed himself to take our sins out of his body even though he was perfect. He went through the suffering and the shame. But when he comes back, it's not going to be the same way. He's coming back as a king. He's coming back to rule. He's coming back to judge. Okay, so don't we, we got to warn the world that this is happening. And that when he comes back, he's not going to be... The, 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 the man that allowed himself to be taken and crucified. Because now he's going to come back and he's going to judge. He said, at least now, if he came back soon, he'd be saying, it's been for 2,000 years you've had an opportunity to realize that I gave myself for you. And if and people don't accept that, hey, there's going to be a judgment. The Bible says in verse 8 of 2 Peter 3, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So he's saying that, look, you might say, hey, it has been a long time since God prophesied this stuff. But he's saying, Christian, don't doubt. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. To God, our, like our, our vision of time means nothing to him. A day, a thousand years. God's outside of time. We live in time. God created time. God's outside time. Whether it's a year, a, a, a year, a minute, a thousand years, to God it, it doesn't matter. So even though you can say now, oh, man, it's been 2,000 years, to God that's nothing. It's 2,000 years. It doesn't mean that it's not coming. It just means it's coming in God's time. And it's going to come. The Bible says in verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. When God makes a promise, he's going to do it. He's not going to forget about it. He's not slack. He's like, oh, well, yeah. It's been a long time, though. I mean, I know I promised this, but, you know, it's, no, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackest, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason why God's even letting it go this long is because God is very merciful and very long suffering, saying, look, 
Believe, believe, believe. I don't want anyone to perish. I'm giving you time. I'm giving you time. But there's going to be a time where it's just, I mean, he's, he's not going to be slack. He's, he's given us, he's given us a, you know, an opportunity. He's given people opportunity. It says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This earth is going to be destroyed. And it's going to do it with heat, fervent heat. He did it with a flood the first time when he destroyed the earth. He's going to destroy the flood. He's going to destroy the earth with fire the next time. Verse eleven: Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise. Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So we should keep our eyes focused on the, the stuff of this earth, the stuff of this world is going to be burned up. It's going to be gone. When Jesus Christ comes back and God pours out his wrath, he's going to do away with this stuff. We don't need to worry about the things that are earthly of this earth. We should stay focused on the things that are to come, on the new heavens and the new earth and, and the, the treasures that we can build up for ourselves in heaven, the things that have eternal value, the thing, not, not the things like your car, your house, or whatever monetary or physical things that you have. They're all going to be burned up. It's going to be gone. It's going to be destroyed. Then what good is it? All that work, all that labor, all that time and energy and focus you put on it, burned up, gone. It means nothing. We need to focus on the things of God. We need to realize and, and one, of the, one of the things we realize with the flood is, is, just remember, I mean, the reason why God did it, He did it because the world became wicked. He judged the earth. The judgment's coming again. Let's all, um, you know, strive and do our best to, to do what's right in God's eyes because if God looks at you, He says, okay, here's a man that's perfect and upright. Here's a man that's righteous. You know, God will, God will save you on this. I mean, I'm not saying every single time 100% because... We're, there are trials and tribulations, but, but here's the thing. If you want to be able to escape some judgment, I mean, and even maybe it is just a localized judgment. Not even talking about the, you know, the, the judgment that's to come because we will escape that. That's already been promised. The wrath that God's going to pour out on the earth, we're going to escape that the same way that Noah did, the same way that Lot did. But I'm just talking about, you know, God, can, God has judgments. I believe this from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. In many instances, when you see like major disasters happen, you know, hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and things that just destroy and decimate, you know, entire towns or entire villages or whatever it is, a lot of times, and, and maybe it's not every single time, but a lot of times I believe that's God's judgment coming upon that, that area and that location because a lot of times it happens to places that are extremely wicked and just, and just full of sin, and God just brings his, his judgment to that place. Now, if you happen to be someone who's living in an area, and, and God's going to bring judgment to an area, hey, make sure that you're found righteous. Make sure you're found upright, because God's able to deliver you out of that. Just as, so, just as a lot was in Sodom. I mean, it was, just, it was just a couple cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, right, that were extremely wicked. God didn't judge the whole world at that point. He just judged that area, but he took Lot out of it. Lot was living, he shouldn't have been living there in the first place, but he was, okay? God took him out. God took him out of that place and saved him from, from that destruction. And we would hope that God would look at us too if something like that were to happen in our area or wherever we are, um, that God would be able to look at us and say, okay, I need to bring this judgment here, but I'm going to make sure that my people are safe. So let's, um, let's just try to keep ourselves in God's good graces and, and give respect unto his word and just remember that, that as loving as God is, he also has wrath. And it's in Jesus' name, let's um, bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for the book of um, Genesis and, and for the story of the flood and of Noah, dear God. It's, it's a really interesting story. It's really hard to get in depth on a lot of the details. There's so many different details um, that, we can, that we can go in depth on here, God, but... Um, Help us to remember that you're not just a God of love, but you're also a God of judgment and justice. And um, we, we will reap what we sow. And, and Lord, um, <clears throat> help us to fear you. We ought to have a proper fear of God in our life. And um, 
that's the, the Bible, you've told us that the beginning of wisdom is to, is to fear you, dear God, and that um, <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God, I pray that you would please just, just work in our hearts, work in our lives. God, help us to warn others about the coming judgment. Um, it's not just some story, it's not some fable, it's going to happen, and we know it's going to happen. We know you're not slack concerning your promise that their judgment is coming on this world. God, help us to love other people enough to take the time to go out and warn them about it and, and to give them an opportunity to get saved because we know that you want everyone to get saved. Help us to, to fulfill your will in doing that and going out and warning others, warning about the judgment and, um, and believing in it completely, dear God, that um, no matter how long it's been, we know that, that it's going to happen. We know that your word is true. And God, we love you and we pray that you please bless everyone that's here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.